Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, video game controllers have certainly evolved over the years. Maybe you remember the original Atari had a, a simple joystick with one simple button. I grew up with the NES. Um, there was no joystick on that controller, but instead a, a little directional pad with four other buttons. And now my kids play with a, a Wii gaming system. I know that's old too now. Uh, and it has a variety of joysticks and buttons. But regardless of the video game, they all include controllers or external ways of controlling the, the uh, characters on the screen. Whether it's Wii Bowling or PC gaming or the, the latest third person shooter game, being able to control imaginary characters on a screen is fun. You control what little Mario does, or this car, or that character. Well, today's sermon is about control, and uh, who or what controls your life. Of course, we see, uh, we see a lot of life, but we all know that behind the scenes, there are a variety of things that control individuals, and even, well, ourselves. Of course, life is not a, a video game, so the answer to who's controlling your life is a bit complicated. It's not necessarily a straightforward or simple answer. But sometimes you probably feel it more acutely that outside forces are controlling your life. Your family needs or wants this from you. Your, your work requires a certain amount of hours out of your life. Your friends want to go here and do this or that. Perhaps you want to do something, but your body tells you otherwise. The question we want to focus on today, especially, is how much control does your Savior have over the course and direction of your life? Our sermon from Luke chapter 13, as well as Paul's reminder to the Philippian Christians, is that we are first and foremost citizens of heaven. It's more important than any other group or uh, whether it be family or nation, national or uh, work or whatever, our first and foremost citizenship is in heaven. Paul tells us, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. However, that kingdom is not without opposition, and Jesus faces some of that opposition in our gospel reading from Luke chapter 13. The Pharisees are trying to manipulate Jesus. They basically want to scare him off. The Pharisees tell Jesus that Herod is trying to kill him. As his opponents, they're, they're not simply relaying information to him, no, they want to be rid of him. They want him to cease and desist. Because Jesus had been preaching about the kingdom of God, and this kingdom that Jesus preached at was certainly different, and sometimes at odds with the kingdoms of Herod or the Pharisees. In Luke chapter 13, which is where our reading is from, in just that one chapter alone, Jesus has had multiple parables or proverbs that condemned the way that society was working, or rather, not working. Remember, this was a society that Herod and the Pharisees were deeply invested in and that they were trying to maintain. And Jesus wasn't cooperating with their agenda, so they tried to control him. Still happens today. You know, the world and all the powers that exist try to control others. Superpowers, for instance, threaten with military forces or, or sanctions or nuclear threats. They hope that their threat will cause their enemy to back down. And this is how it often works in the world, you know, one, two, three, four. When arguments don't work, the next step is often threats. When threats don't work, it's followed by punishment. And when punishment doesn't work, the last resort is simply forcing others 
to the desired outcome. That's typically how uh, power in this world often works. Now, there is a proper place for authority, but force really should only be used as a last resort, a truly last resort. Yet, even as a simple parental authority, I know that it's tempting to resort to higher on the chart than is strictly necessary. And I think that's true of, of all people in authority. Those in positions of power and authority often follow this little chart. And unfortunately, often authority is often abused when powers refuse to accept that they can't control everything. They often resort to violence and force because, well, those are the easiest solutions, even if they are not the best solutions. Uh, unfortunately, because we are human, because everyone on this earth is, we struggle with authority from a, a variety of different angles. Some are put in to positions of authority to exercise power judiciously. But it's hard for these leaders to accept when they can't control things. It's easy for us to overstep our authority. And a simple example, maybe it's easier since we're all adults to see it in kids, it's, it's not appropriate really for a child to try to force or punish a fellow child. They don't have the authority. But that doesn't stop them from trying often. I don't have the authority to punish my fellow citizens because I'm not a judge or police officer. But we all like, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we all like to fight the power, too. We don't like to accept others' authorities because, well, we typically assume that we are better judges than anyone else. Now, the Pharisees and Herod alike were in positions of power, but they, too, clearly struggled with these things. Uh, maybe they maybe struggled as the wrong, wrong world because word we because we don't really see them struggling we just see them giving themselves over uh, to power and the pursuit of power they could not accept Jesus's authority or would not and they did not try at the and they certainly did not try stopping to control things now the proof of Jesus's authority was right there in front of them to see if only they would open their eyes but they we were told repeatedly deliberately shut their eyes to the truth. I mean, some of the proof was Jesus spoke with authority that we read that even the people recognized. And Jesus' miracles, for that matter, had the same sort of quality, uh, power, and aim as Yahweh's miracles throughout Israel's history. They, they should have been able to recognize these things. Um, Yet the Pharisees and Herod tried to control Jesus as if he were, as if they were in authority over him. But Jesus cannot be knocked off track by traditional threats or power plays. You can just throw that little chart out, those four steps, because none of it's going to work on Jesus. Jesus says, go tell that fox, Herod, basically, I've got business to attend to, and I'm not stopping for him. Jesus is not stopping. And what exactly is it that Jesus is doing? Well, he tells us in his response, he is healing. He is casting out demons. Now, he's not out seeking to destroy Herod or the Pharisees, but he certainly won't stop healing or casting out evil spirits either, even if some of those unclean spirits and thoughts seem to have found place in folks like the, some of the Pharisees and Herod. Jesus has come to cast out evil from human beings and to heal us. And those, unfortunately, who refuse to repent and adopt evil ways, they'll find themselves outside of God's kingdom. Jesus preaches. Jesus teaches. He demonstrates his own faith, and he inspires the faith of others. But he's not violent. Jesus doesn't try to intimidate or browbeat his opponents or force them. He teaches people to, on the other hand, turn the other cheek, not to assault their enemies. Oh. 
Could you go back? I, I went back to force, not faith. Um, thanks. Uh, God is not interested in making us do what he wants. Now, that's what the Herod and the Pharisees were doing. It's what world powers continue to do. And, and that's often what we, I think, suspect or maybe accuse God of doing. We say that God is trying to force us. Um, but we think this way because it's how we think. We think God is, act, is treating others this way because it's how we often treat others. We often turn to threats, punishments, and force to get our way. But God's not about force when he's about faith. Jesus won't be stopped by force or because of the threat of government's disapproval. Jesus won't even be stopped um, when they resort to violence against him. That's why he laments, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered you your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, Jesus does not try to turn us to his way of thinking by violence or force, even though he does have the authority to do this if he wanted. But he has a different strategy. Jesus says to his opponents, who also happen to be his people, the people of the Lord, when you insult me, I will say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When you strike me, I will not call down 10,000 angels. I will say, why do you come at me with clubs and swords? And when you come to kill and crucify me, I will come back. Because God, through the cross, does not try to force us to follow him. He does not seek to punish us. He would have had every reason and right and authority to do exactly that. He is our creator. He is our Lord and our God. But instead, he chose to invite us to follow him through his suffering and death. You see, Jesus has not come to overpower violence with violence. He has come to suffer, to die, to be buried, and to rise again. Back to the issue of control. What is it that controls you and I? Well, because we have been freed in Christ, it no longer needs to be the threat of world leaders. It's not the expectations of a pleasure-obsessed or consumeristic society. We believe in a power and a love more compelling than the threat of any man. Paul puts it this way. What controls us? For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised again. What controls you and me? It's the love of Christ. It's, it's not God controlling us, but the love of Christ, which compels us which inspires us because of all that Christ has done to live no longer just for ourselves, but for him who died. We don't have to live according to what the world says. Governments, popular opinion, or what others have expect us, others expect of us don't need to control us or even frighten us too badly. But that doesn't mean that we live selfishly or self-righteously. No, we live inspired by the love of of Christ. And as he gave his life for us, we also give our lives to serve him. For Christians, it's not about controlling others or letting other people control us either. Rather, it's about letting the love of Christ control us because God's love changes everything. In Jesus' name, amen.